for the people who aren't familiar with Todaytix, uh, Todaytix is a, is a platform through which you can buy really cheap theater tickets, Broadway tickets, musical tickets. If you don't believe me, you can check it out. You can buy like almost $20 tickets to um, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, sometimes even enter the ha Hamilton lottery um, and all that good stuff. So uh, I've been at Todaytix for the last two years. I started working as a product manager at Todaytix in 2017. Prior to that, I was I was studying in school at Georgia Tech. Um, I was studying engineering there. And um, what really drove me to join and start my career as a product manager was um, starting my own company at college or trying to start my own company at college. It failed miserably, but that really made me understand um, the different things that go into product management and understanding, uh, you know, how like how I can take that up as a career uh, once I graduated. Um, so I'm sure like as most of you know, or a few of you may know that product management is um, a very sweet intersection between generally tech, business, and design. A few other, other things that end up coming into product, product management is data and communication. Um, I put this in there. Usually when you see a chart of product management, you'll see like three circles and the sweet spot of product manager being at the intersection. But um, data and growth and uh, communication are something that I feel are extremely crucial as well to a product manager uh, when you're trying to like ship a product out or like, uh, you know, make... Uh, features and build things up. Um, next slide. So this is the, the classic problem, which I feel like everyone feels where it's like, how do I become a product manager if I'm not a product manager? If you look at all the different job postings online, they'll usually say that you need for a junior PM, you need two to four years of experience or one to three years of experience. They usually expect people to transition from another product manager role, but getting the first product management role is what I thought was extremely challenging. I started off without prior experience in the industry. My first job was a PM, so I definitely know how hard it was to actually get my foot through the right door. Um, but I'm hoping that through this presentation, maybe I can help you maybe un like basically unravel some of this monster. Um, so traditionally what people end up doing for transitioning over to product management is um, either doing internships as a PM or a product analyst, which is fairly easier to get. Um, maybe also going for like grad school or MBAs, a lot of product managers, a lot of product management um, roles require you to be um, an MBA grad many times. Uh, or a lot of times people just transition into it from being at a different role within the company. So maybe you worked as an engineer or an analyst and you spent like three to four years at the company. You're a subject matter expert of the vertical of the, what the company is doing and you feel you're you know okay to actually make a shift into product management. Um, but that's not the only way. You can also take school classes at product school. You can also uh, do some of the things I'm about to tell you in the presentation to actually transition into product management. So the first thing that I started doing, which I think was very, very helpful, was truly understanding what product management is and what product managers do. Um, I think each and every company handles product managers and product management very differently. Um, usually there are three different kinds of approaches. One of them, the first one being a very engineering led product management. What that means is that, you know, um, companies like cloud, cloud front companies or companies that are big data where there's a lot of tech heavy work that happens. Um, they prefer to actually let the engineers do a lot of the scoping of the work and product managers are essentially just um, sort of like shipping the product over, writing the requirements, communicating with the customers, but it's kind of very engineering focused. Um, so when you are able to know, when you're doing your research, you kind of want to identify what it is that you care the most about. Are you more strong with engineering? Are you more strong with design or more strong with product? Um, so that's the first approach. The second one is product light engineering, which is what most of the new companies tend to do right now. Um, today, take the company I work for is definitely more between product light engineering and product engineering collaboration. Um, what happens here is like the product manager has the ability to talk to a lot of the customers um, very directly. They're able to get um, feedback from the customers, requirements from the customers, and then eventually um, ship that, make a product requirement document or a PRD, if you've heard of that, um, and ship that over to consumers or the engineers and actually build something out from there and then iterate on that product itself. Um, product and engineering collaboration is definitely the sweet spot between these two, but it's harder to actually get to um, just because um, typically one way or the other, depending on the strengths of the organization, it you know usually like tips over on one side or the other. Um, but ideally you'd want to work very collaboratively with the engineers so that the engineers feel that they are a part of the bigger picture and it's not just the PM who is like doing all the work and getting all the stuff to them and they're just adding acting as service or servers to the product that has to be developed. But they're looking more into actually 
okay, this is why I want to build this product. This is how this product actually solves the problem that the PM is talking about. So the next step, I would say, this is no by no means in any like order of uh, you know priority that like you must do this first and that second. But I kind of just section the presentation out to ensure that I'm touching every point that I think is important for you to do before you actually start interviewing as a PM. Um, identifying your strengths and weaknesses um, because product management requires you to be analytical. It requires you to be familiar with design. It requires you to be talking to customers and stakeholders, being emotionally intelligent, doing relationship management. It kind of like uses all parts of your brain um, as a product manager where I have one meeting with an engineer and then second meeting with a designer and the third meeting with someone from data there's a lot of context switching that happens and you want to be sure that you are like aware and alert and all the time and if there are uh, things that you identify as you know this is something I could work on more this is something that is my strength and I want to definitely like put it out there to all my stakeholders that come to me for everything data related um, that's something that you should try to do as a um, you know in the beginning one of the good resources I actually used was Strength Finder. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Um, it's a book which has an exercise through which you can actually find out what um, your soft skills are and what are the things that you actually want to be more, you know, want to improve at or you want to actually um, hone on more. So that's more for soft skills. But for the harder part of it, the hard skills, I think it's important. Maybe you try to like take some questions online. There are like different coding challenges that you can try to attempt if you're familiar with coding and see where your weaknesses are, or if there's some kind of data analysis assignments that you can do to analyze, okay, these are my strengths and these are my weaknesses. I think self-awareness would be the first step to actually understanding uh, which direction you want to head to as a product manager. Uh, can't emphasize on this enough, but reading is truly like the best thing to do when you're trying to prepare for an interview or you're trying to be just generally sound as a product manager or you're trying to have an intelligent, intelligent conversation by the water cooler that is not related to anything that you're doing at your work. Um, so I think there are a few, um, few newsletters and blogs that I really, really like. One of them is by Ken Norton. Um, he uh, has in incredible articles on the different things going on in product. Um, Julie Zhao, she's a VP of design at Facebook, I think. She has a really incredible book as well. And she um, is also a fantastic writer and uh, talks a lot about um, design principles in general. Product Hunt, TechCrunch, I think all of these are really good for different aspects of product management in general. Uh, books, Design of Everyday Things by Greg Norman. I think that is uh, the first book that you should read. It makes you feel very attentive um, to all the products around you, whether it's a hard product or a soft product. You look at a chair and you'll be like, okay, why is it structured this way? Or you look at the window, why is the handle not tilted to the left versus the right? I think it makes you think a lot. And um, that's the kind of mindset and the frame of mind you want to be adapted to as soon as you start thinking of, you know, I want to be a product manager. Uh, the next step is networking. I feel like one of the reasons that y'all are here is, you know, already taking this step forward, which is networking, which is incredible. Um, there's a lot of online communities on Slack. Uh, product School has one, I believe, as well. Women in Product is a really uh, very uh, active community. Uh, Stellar Peers, I've used a lot for interview preps. Uh, it's You can actually find a partner to prep with. Um, and it's kind of funny in the beginning where you just meet up with a stranger on Hangouts and they quiz you and you quiz them. But it's really helped me uh, become a better interviewer as well. Um, meetups and events, again, you know, there's a product group meetup, there's a product school meetup, New York Women in Product, there's just a few. I have a very, very long, long list if you want, I can share it with you after, uh, for books, for communities, and for online groups if you're interested in. Um, and the other thing maybe like when you're trying to network and go for these um, events is would be helpful if you're actually um, start thinking of your elevator pitch. Um, so kind of identifying what are the different industries you may be wanting to step into, what are the different projects you've worked on, how does that relate to product management, uh, a very quick elevator pitch that you're trying to get to uh, when you're talking to someone so that they're engaged in, the, in your conversation and they're engaged in what you're interested in and you're able to find that common point between that person and yourself. Um, the, the one of the most important parts that we're coming to is now thinking like a PM. I still, I've still like only scratched the surface of that, but I'm trying to do that every day at my job. Um, I think, uh, this is something that I've kind of gone theoretical in this design th thinking versus systems thinking. Not sure if you're familiar with design thinking or system thinking. Are you, um, have you read anything about design thinking? Show of hands. Okay. And systems thinking. All right. Um, so design thinking is generally, um, a newer approach compared to systems thinking. So design thinking is more of like looking at consumer 
synthesizing the information, coming back, uh, thinking of like a product and iterating on the product and kind of like building up from the requirements. Whereas systems thinking is about like thinking from an end to end um, journey of a consumer, like a strategy or an end to end journey of a consumer and breaking that down into different components. Uh, I studied engineering and systems thinking is something that is inbuilt in almost every class because you're what you get is like you have a problem statement. How can I break that down into different components? What are the different components inter that interact with it? What are the different components that are isolated? How can I make sure like each component is acting the way it is? And how can I actually optimize the problem? And design thinking is an approach in reverse a little bit, uh, but it's an iteration on systems thinking. I think sometimes what, I, what I've read online is like either you're a product manager who has more, more of an affinity to design thinking or more of an affinity to systems thinking. But I think the intersection is what is actually optimal as a product manager. You want to be able to think from a design thinking perspective as well, getting things out fast, uh, shipping things out as soon as possible, but also system thinking where you're breaking the problem down to understand the core, co the core of the problem and being able to actually uh, dissect it in a way that, you know, you aren't, you're fully like a subject matter expert of that. Uh, the other thing that I feel I've, again, I'm just starting to understand and trying to do is questioning the why. What ends up happening, at least, um, you know, in my experience as a product manager is someone comes to me and they're like, Hey, I think we need to build a solution of like being able to share this on Facebook because I think it will actually drive more conversion online. They'll come to me with a solution. They'll come to me with why they think the solution is important, but they'll never tell me what the problem is. And there's so many times I can't tell you that. I feel like the solution is just one way of solving the problem. There could be multiple ways of solving the problem. Maybe Facebook share isn't that popular. Maybe Twitter share is more popular. Maybe WhatsApp is more popular. So I think it's important to very, like very clearly dissect what the problem is. Most of the times, even in interviews and even in your day to day jobs, what ends up happening is you're very focused on thinking on the solution and thinking of shipping the solution and um, then sometimes a product manager and sometimes the rest of the team because of that loses sight of the problem you're trying to solve. So getting that questioning the why and understanding what the problem is, is extremely important to actually being able to ship the product out correctly. Um, some other things I did that were really quick things um, to actually get me to the product mindset. One, like I mentioned, problem first approach, always thinking what the problem is. Second is I'm started maintaining a product log. So on Evernote or like whatever notes application you have, uh, once I started thinking that I want to be a product manager, I had like a list of um, these are the good things about a product I'm using. These are the bad things I'm using. Uh, these are the ways pro this product can be improved. And I started ma maintaining a log of that. And I realized that with each product thought, each time I gave a thought to a product, my thoughts were getting more thoughtful. They were deeper. They were more, they were more structured. They were more systematic. They were more organized. And that'll really help you understand like, okay, why is this product not as good as the other one? Why is Lyft different than Uber? What is better in Lyft? What is not as good in Uber? So there's such similar products, but there's a lot of difference in those products itself if you start thinking about it. So being able to identify that on a day-to-day -day basis and actually maintaining a log of that, which you can refer to at a certain point in the later in the future, is super helpful for you. And you can actually maybe, you know, gauge your own awareness on product mindset over, you know, as you, as you continue to do this and focus on simplicity. Um, this is something I just added recently. I mean, something I again started working on very recently. Uh, ten, typically what tends to happen is product managers or generally people who are trying to solve a problem want to give you like, the overall the best product possible right if you have a problem that i want to get from point a to point b you may want to think of like okay what happens if um someone wants to go a b or c what happens if someone wants to stop make a stop elsewhere you start thinking of all the edge cases which is great but in the end, you want to ship the product that actually solves the problem so you want to be very focused and very focus on the simplicity of the problem. Like you don't want to overcomplicate it. Uh, that can tend to happen because you want to think of all the different edge cases and all the basic edge cases should actually be covered, but not all the things have to be covered. Um, so that is something that I feel like as a product manager, as you're you know working and you're growing and evolving, uh, being able to narrow down what the problem is and focusing on that is super important. Um, I think this is like a good diagram I found where like these are all the different things that you probably do each and every day uh, as a PM, whether it's like thinking about communication, it's thinking about listening. Listening is like the key to actually being able to solve anything, um, being able to actually prioritize the the 
features that are coming in, prioritizing the actions that have to be taken, working with design, working with engineering, working with leadership, measuring success, experimenting and A-B testing. Um, all those things probably happen like every single day of your, you know, of your day-to-day -day job. So each and every day is different. Uh, but some of the things that I started doing in college when I realized that I wanted to be a product manager without any prior experience, one of them I already spoke to you about was starting my own company, which failed. But there was a great starting, great selling story where I was like, okay, I started something, I failed, but I learned X, Y, Z things. So that was a great thing to do. Um, taking relevant classes definitely helps if you know product management has an intersection of tech, intersection of design, maybe taking classes in human computer interaction, maybe some taking classes in data analysis is super helpful. Um, the other thing that I started doing also was that, that helped me was starting to write blogs. Um, even if it's like, you know, analyzing or reviewing a product that you use every day, just being able to think and write a structured, um, structured like uh, answer around like why this product sucks or why this product is great will be super helpful or uh, Quora actually has a lot of product questions that get posted. So trying to like be in that, in that loop of actually being able to answer those questions, even if it's in line in the beginning, but then you gradually take it over to like adding more depth to your answers. Um, so those are a few things that I think help. Starting a side project doesn't have to be super technical. It can as simple, be, it can be very simple as, you know, talking to like 100 people and then finding out a common problem, thinking of a solution that a very, um, a very low fidelity mock-up of the solution you can make on even Keynote. My first, um, design presentation I made was on Keynote. It wasn't even on Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, so just doing the bare minimum that is required to actually start thinking and, you know, being in the product mindset. Uh, getting the interview. I think this is something that is, that can be challenging because when you don't have PM interview, uh, you don't have PM experience, you are, you feel like you're not going to get anything. But honestly, it is just a numbers game. I can't tell you how many times I've spent weekends just applying to jobs or jobs that were like three to four, four years of experience, zero to two years of experience, all different kinds of jobs I've applied to because each job has required you, something different out of you. And that's made me think of like, how can I add value to that job? It is a numbers game. It is time consuming, but then the rewards are definitely worth it. Um, I know my friend sitting at the back, he can tell you that there are a lot of times on weekends. I've only, only just applied to jobs I probably shouldn't have even thought of. Uh, but it helped me get interviews with a few people and then helped me get a couple of offers. So if you've applied to like 200 jobs, you maybe get like 15 interviews. You may get like four on sites and then one job offer. That's kind of what happened to me. <laughs> um, but it, it's a very, I think like with each interview, I learned so much about myself. I learned, I got sharper with the, the following interview, I learned that, okay, if I, if they ask me a question X, this is how I should be structuring my answer and not just jumping right into it. I should take a moment to pause and think about the answer. So there are a lot of things that you learn from each interview that you end up taking. Um, so just don't say no to any, any interview, even if it is not a very product related interview and it's remotely related to product, just go for it because you'll learn so much out of it. Um, so from, I guess, when you end up doing a finding your strengths and weaknesses, you'll be able to understand that, okay, these are all the different things that I can do. So I can under, I can talk to a designer, I can talk to an engineer, and I can talk to a data analyst, but I can actually also do a lot of like data analysis myself. So you need to understand all the different breadths of the things that you're able to do, but then really ex make yourself a subject matter expert or make, us, make your superpower obvious to the person you're talking to that I'm really good at this, but I can also do X, Y, Z. So people will hire you for that one superpower. They don't expect everyone to know every single thing. Um, nobody really knows what they're doing. So it's just, <laughs> I think it's important to actually understand the different breadths of the things that you should be com comfortable with. And this is the one thing that you think, okay, I can definitely do this very well. And um, I should be hired for that. Um, acing the interview. There's so much, so many resources. This is not all the steps you need to do. This is just... Um, like a bird's eye view of all the things you have to do to ace the interview. Uh, but what helped me was getting a practice buddy, um, sometimes a friend, sometimes someone from Stella Peers, like I mentioned, or another online community where you can actually pair with a stranger to interview them and also interview, uh, get yourself interviewed. When you're interviewing someone else who's also trying to get into product management, you will start thinking of things that, okay, why didn't this person say this thing? Why didn't the person actually say it this way? And you start thinking not just for them, but for yourself. 
and that's going to help you with the product manager interview as well. And then when you are getting interviewed, of course, that's going to help you just hone your skills over and over again. Um, reading is probably the best thing. There's a lot of resources. I think I have that in the next slide, but a lot of resources that you can use to crack the PM interview. Um, there's a 30 day guide. There's a 15 day guide. There's a five day guide, depending on how much time you want to spend on actually interview, uh, preparing for the interview. Um, Usually um, in interviews, they want to talk about frameworks. So if someone asks you a question like, okay, how would you design uh, a travel app? That is literally the question you'll get, right? Um, then it is your job as a PM interviewee to dissect the problem, be like, okay, what is the travel app supposed to do? Is it supposed to be a competitor to Airbnb? Or is it supposed to be for a demographic of you know, 50 and above? Or is it supposed to be for super young children? You need to dissect the problem. What is that I'm trying to solve with this problem statement? Um, and that can really happen very well if you have a framework in your mind. Um, there's a ton of different frameworks. One of them is called um, the fishbone analysis, there's a circles method. I'll go into a couple of them later on. Um, but generally having a couple of frameworks on the, you know, on top of your sleeve to be like, okay, I'm definitely going to plug this in and quickly think of all the different things I need to think of in, in one second it will help you answer the question really well. Um, and starting early and then accepting that failing is okay. And then learning from the interview and then taking that feedback and iterating on that is probably your best thing that you can do. Um, after an interview, I always reach out to the, rec the recruiter asking them for feedback. Many times I'm ghosted and they don't respond to me, uh, but sometimes they're kind enough. And uh, when I interview people and they ask me for feedback, I always make sure I send it to them. Um, but try to get feedback for as much as you can. Um, it'll help you with you know, your following interview that you, end up, you have lined up. Um, so one of the things that I actually learned was like when I started the interview process first, I was asked a question and I remembered that, oh, I've actually read this question online somewhere. I definitely know this answer. So before he even finished the question, I just jumped into the answer and I was like, okay, this is what you need to do. And he was like, I didn't even finish my question. And obviously I didn't get that job because the question was directed to something else. Uh, but the first thing is like, you need to be a really good listener, not just in the interview, but also as a product manager. If you're not listening, not observing, it's going to be extremely hard to understand the problem itself. It'll be super hard to understand what you need to observe and what is the actual pain point. You may catch on to something that is not even the actual problem that is being addressed. Um, asking questions, um, being comfortable to ask questions because there is no nothing like a stupid question, nothing like nothing as such as a stupid question. Um, so being able to ask questions is extremely important. Um, that's how you'll get clarity on what the problem is. That's how you'll be able to understand what you need to solve for taking a moment to breathe and then starting to think of your answer. And in that breath, maybe try to structure your answer with the framework that you already have in mind and then give the answer. And while you're answering, always make sure to check in with the interviewer that am I answering a question? Is there something else that you should you think I should think of? Um, is does this answer the problem that you're talking about? And then probably at the end, summarize. Um, so one of the um, few of the uh, resources I used, I was surprised as how this, this website, the first one, productmanagementexercises.com, is not spoken about at all. Um, it has so many questions and so many answers. You can post your answer on it. You can get feedback on the answers. You can give feedback to people. It is incredible. I use that a lot. And um, Stella Pierce, I mentioned a few times, um, is also amazing. Impact Interview is um, by this guy, Lewis Lin, who used to work at Google, and he has a couple of books as well. And he has an Impact Interview and a Slack channel as well. Um, don't pay for it. It's not worth it. I paid and it was useless. But the free resources are great. Uh, and a lot of Medium blogs and articles are also super helpful. If you just like go to product management blogs on uh, Medium, I have a list of that as well. I can share um, and if you, um, after the presentation if you want. Um, books Tracking the PM Interview is great. Decode and Conquer and the product man manager interview, they kind of go um, hand in hand. And the PM interview workbook is also great. They're, I think the three of them are by Lewis Lin. So he's a really great thought leader to follow. Um, so talking about frameworks, I'm just going to dig into like just one of them. Uh, it's called Circles Framework. Um, it is extremely straightforward. So let's say the question is design a travel app for design a travel app. That's all the question is, right? Um, the first Thing that you should think of is what is it for who is it for why are we doing this and how does it have to be so you can think of like are we looking at a specific age group are we looking at a specific um region are we why are we doing this is it because airbnb is tanking is it because uh, we want to like 
you know, to com- be a competitor in the market. Um, what is the app we're trying to do? What is the purpose of the travel app? Is it for hotels? Is it for uh, flights? Is it for commute? Because travel can mean anything. And it's wrong for you to assume that it is for hotel stay or it is for travel. It could be for both or it could be for just recommendations maybe. And how do you want to do that? Do you want to build a um, website? Do you want to build uh, an iOS app, a web app or a Android app? So that's the first thing. The second step is identify the customer. Um, Who are you building this for? Uh, What are their, you know, what does the customer look like to you? Suppose that the app is built for someone who's 60 plus, is not super tech savvy. Um, Describe the customer to yourself. What are the needs that you think the customer may have? Uh, Report the customer needs that if I'm a 60 year old person and I'm looking to go to travel to, I don't know, like India, um, I want to be able to get travel recommendations, um, you know, 30 days before I actually make my trip or some kind of like travel problem statement that actually addresses the needs of the customer. Then from all the different needs that you may gather for the customer, you want to prioritize the needs. You can't solve for all the problems. You want to pick one thing that you think is the most um, feasible, most lucrative that you may think is the most addressable in, in terms of the sizable market that is there. Um, when you prioritize, you want to think of what the estimate of the return on investment is. Is you think it's going to make you money? Do you think it's going to get you users? What is it that you're trying to prioritize for? Then for that, for that need that you've addressed, you want to si- find all the solutions. You can maybe have recommendations generated by um, a person that is hired by a company to write these recommendations, or it is generated through friends, or it is generated, generated through different like aggregation of travel blogs. There's so many ways of solving the problem of recommendations. You want to figure out all, you want to list out all the solutions once you identify the needs. Then you want to think of the trade-offs. This is where like you want to prioritize your matrix of, okay, um, this solution that I've listed will require two developers. It'll give me, it'll take like five months to, to build. It's going to uh, unpack like, you know, 800 users or whatever the number is. But the other solution may actually do something different. It may require more users. It may take, it may impact more users. It may solve a smaller problem, but it may actually require fewer developers and you can ship out faster. So you want to evaluate what the trade-offs are in terms of the resources, in terms of the impact, in terms of the users are impacting. And then finally, summarize a recommendation. Um, in all of these questions, none of None of the interviewers expect an answer. They don't expect the next unicorn to come up. They just expect you to be able to structure your answer um, in a very thoughtful way as a product manager should. And that is what the Circles framework actually does. Any questions that you want me to ask ask right now? Okay. Uh, The next step, let's say you've aced all the interviews, you have five job offers lined up, you've chosen your job offer, and then you want to see how you succeed as a PM. Uh, As a product manager, you, like I mentioned, you have hard skills and then you have soft skills. Hard skills on a day-to-day, you are looking at um, data analysis, you're looking at conducting, first thing, conducting customer interviews, actually. You should be able to, you should be able to talk about, talk as a customer to any stakeholder. Like you should feel the same pain the customer's feeling. You should be as frustrated as a most frustrated custom, customer and as delighted as a most delighted customer. So truly understanding the customers and being able to conduct customer interviews. You can do that through user testing, which is like, you know, through online research. You can also call them in person to your office, uh, conduct research in person. Um, and usually you have, you should make a plan for that. You can be, this is a whole different topic, so I don't want to get too much into it. Um, then running design sprints, being able to actually um, collaborate with designers when you have all these requirements. How can you um, come up with a solution in like five days or like four days or like a sprint that you may define? There's a really good book called The Sprint. I forget who the author is. Yeah. That is it. Uh, he used to work at Google Ventures and he... Uh, it was amazing. And we use it at TodayTix as well, where we actually redesigned our entire homepage through just one week of a design sprint. Um, feature prioritization and roadmap planning, that goes kind of without saying you have a billion features. Um, every stakeholder thinks their feature is the most important feature. And you have to make sure you can pr- prioritize that. Say no when you have to. Say yes when you can. And then plan it in your roadmap. Resource allocation. Uh, You may have two Android engineers, you may have five iOS engineers, you may have one uh, website engineer. You want to make sure that all of this is accounted for when you're thinking of building a product out. Um, Performing market assessments, understanding uh, what the competition is, understanding uh, the space that you're trying to launch in, understanding the geography of the market you're running into, uh, going to. So that's another uh, sector that you should uh, probably think of. 
uh, translating business to technical requirements and the other way around. So if you think of a feature and you're like, okay, I need to translate this over to technical requirements, you want to speak to the engineers to make sure you're able to break the feature up. Like for instance, if I want to build like a redirect to, um, to a website link, how do I break that feature up in terms of technical requirements? Should this happen based on location? Should this happen when you click on this link? How can you sp slice that problem up as much as you can for technical requirements? And then from that, you want to think of how can I translate that over to non-tech people? Like people are talking in the tech world, they're talking about Nginx, they're talking about CloudFront, they're talking about CDNs. What does that mean? People should be able to understand that. So vice versa, I should be able to get um, a good sense of the spectrum from both ends. Uh, pricing and revenue model. Um, if you're launching a feature, how what should it be priced? Usually PMs are not always like major stakeholders in that, but definitely a, a stakeholder enough to like understand that um, if this feature is launched at this um, this dollar value, what is the revenue that we're looking at? Is there an ad model we need to add? Is it like you know if we see subscriptions tanking, should we revamp the pricing model? So being being able to understand this and keeping a finger on the pulse is important, and then defining and tracking success metrics. Honestly, without that, all of this work that you do is kind of pointless. If you can't define and track the work that you've done and understood the impact of that, um, what is the point of doing it? It might as well have not done that work, right? Um, so there are different ways of doing that. One is A-B testing, um, which is usually just splitting the group into like 50-50, uh, giving a control variation, control group of uh, the baseline variation, which is the existing experience, and the other group gets um, the new experience. You kind of track a North Star metric, like maybe conversion, and you try to see, okay, is um, the baseline performing better? Is the variation one group performing better? So then you know, run it for a few months or a few days, and you kind of um, decide on the success of the feature. Defining and tracking success metrics, exactly. So and um, not just A-B testing. I think when you launch a feature, you should be able to analyze, okay, well, this feature, should I should be tracking these events driven by these, these users. These events should have all these different properties associated with it. What happens when I, uh, you know, if I see a drop in conversion when the A-B test is over because of this feature? So kind of being able to create dashboards and tracking that and being able to sort of communicating that to all your stakeholders is super important. Um, the other part is emotional intelligence, uh, empathizing with customer, like I mentioned, uh, frustrated customer, you're angry, delighted customer, you're ecstatic, uh, assessing pain points. Um, it's kind of not just, this is not just consumer driven, it's also being able to do that with stakeholders internally in the, in the organization. Uh, what happens when someone's come with like a feature request that they thought is the most important thing and you have to say no to them? You should be able to have that intelligence of dealing with that well enough where they think that this will help their team, but you have five other things that have to be done because it's going to help the company more than that feature. So being able to actually be friends with your um, stakeholders, being being able to have that intelligence to communicate that intelligence is important. Uh, relationship management kind of also goes along with emotional intelligence. You want to be able to say no when you can um, or when you have to and yes when you can. Um, that builds trust as well when you know that, okay, I tell my, one of the stakeholders that, sorry, we can't build this Facebook share feature now. I'm going to prioritize it for the next quarter. I'm making a ticket for this. This is a ticket number. Um, if I don't remember, ping me later on. Um, if you want to have a chat about this after, let's talk about this. So making sure that you're fully actually vested in their philosophy, in their world, and things that will make their lives easier is important. Um, Communication, I think there's there's nothing like over communication as a PM, no matter how many times you tell the same thing over and over again, people are bound to forget because they're going to read that email, they're going to move over to something else and they'll try to do their job and this may just slip their mind. So being very overly communicative is key to actually building that good relationship. Um, and trust, again, like comes with like being friends with them, also being able to be very fully transparent about what is going on. If you're saying no to their product, why are you you no to their feature, why are you saying no to them? Um, and finally, is self-awareness. Um, if you're not sure of how you're performing, uh, there's no way you can improve. So being able to get feedback from your stakeholders, from your direct reports, or from your people you're reporting to is important. I started journaling um, my journey as a product manager. I called it Fire Festival. <laughs> and because uh, I was like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, and it was it was great. I, I feel like in the beginning, when I started off, I realized that I was jumping into solutions before thinking of the problems. But towards the later end or in recent past, I'm thinking more and more of the problem and less of the solution. Because when you're thinking of the problem, you'll have so many different solutions coming to your head and you'll be able to think from a vast option of solutions coming to you. Um, and owning up to your mistakes. I can't tell you, there's so many times where the features I've worked on have failed miserably. And... Um, 
it was supposed to like lead conversion, like increase conversion by like 4%, 3%, and it's actually like hurt conversion. But then being able to own up to your mistakes and saying that, okay, you know, this is what I did wrong. Um, this is how I think I could have done this better or, and not saying that this is how I think he could have done better and like she could have done better. It's more like this is how I think or the team could have done. This is how I could have led the team to actually have done better. Um, it sucks. Like you may not get as much recognition as you may think you deserve, but you will definitely get that much criticism that you don't think you should get. Uh, so, but then owning up to your mistakes, knowing that what you're doing is for the company and for the organization and for leading the organization to a better um, future and time management because you'll have all of these different things to be done in half of the day and then another, another set of things to be done in half the day.